Almost all fiddle music was once designed solely for dancing. The idea of playing for listening, either at a concert or on a recording, is a relatively recent one, as is the idea of playing in a session purely for pleasure. Within the last century, the link between dance and live music has been weakened. In many dance contexts, recorded music is now the preferred format, either for financial reasons or because it's easier to achieve exactly what's required by using something pre-prepared. From the fiddler's point of view, this divorce allows a greater degree of freedom to explore different aspects of technique, variation and expression, which are not possible within the confines of dance accompaniment. Nevertheless, fiddling is in some ways impoverished when it loses its original function, and it's often valuable to understand why certain tunes or types of tune reach their present form because of the dance. In this piece, we'll look at a number of different types of traditional dance to see what links remain with live music and how each makes particular demands on the fiddler. We'll also see what practical steps a fiddler can take to make playing for dance more effective. We'll start with Irish step dancing. One of the occasional delights of playing Irish music in a noisy London pub is when some girl puts down her drink, gets up in front of the band unannounced and, for the sheer hell of it, gives us 30 seconds of solo dancing. Arms by the side, feet kicking high, this is what people call river dancing. This is in fact Irish step dance, more energetic and graceful than anything an amateur English dancer will ever come up with. Step dancing is largely competitive. Children, mostly girls, start at a very early age learning at a dance school. They will give group performances, a posse of Shirley Temples dressed in elaborately embroidered costumes and wearing huge ringleted wigs. The earliest step dancing competitions were held in 1897, but it was in 1930 that the highly formalised rules were laid down by the Gaelic Dancing Commission. The river dance phenomenon of the 1990s gave a huge boost to step dancing and it remains popular today. So what does step dancing mean for the fiddler? The most likely situation in which you'll find yourself confronted with step dancing is in the aforementioned informal pub setting, or if you're playing at a wedding when a proud and pushy mother may drag her reluctant daughter up onto the stage to ask if she can do a dance. The good news is that in either of these situations all you need to ascertain is does the little darling want a jig or a reel? You then start playing and stop shortly after she does. Oh, and don't be too annoyed when she gets three times as much applause as you've had all night. The other, thankfully far less likely scenario, is that you are asked to play for a contest or formal performance of step dancing. This is another kettle of fish entirely, and you'll be well advised to be otherwise engaged that night. Formal step dancing is complex and disciplined, and so is the music. The tempo has to be exactly right, and there is often a particular tune expected for each dance. Furthermore, many of these tunes are crooked, with odd structures and half bars. Step dance also has its own terminology, such as the light jig, hop jig and treble jig, which coincide in no way with musicians' terminology. For all of these reasons, step dancing is very often done to recorded music. Specialised recordings, mostly by accordion players, are used, some of which use the most abysmal synthesised backing known to man. For many step dancers, the quality of the music is irrelevant, and all they require is the correct tempo and the correct number of beats. Having done my best to discredit the whole sorry affair, there are some tunes, particularly the slip jig, which you will never fully appreciate as a fiddler until you see a really skilled dancer doing her thing. Now let's look at set dancing. Set dancing is in some ways closely related to step dancing and in some ways quite different. The main difference is that it's far more of a social dance. Set dancing is today regarded as extremely traditional in Ireland and remains very popular. Ironically, it was in the early 20th century outlawed by the Gaelic League and the Irish Dance Commission who regarded it as a foreign monstrosity. Although it can be danced for performance or competition, it is most commonly done for pleasure. The set in set dancing refers both to the group of eight people, four couples usually arranged in a square, and to the dance itself. Set dancing is descended from the quadrilles brought to Ireland from the continent by the British Army in the 19th century. Local tunes have been adopted and adapted to suit the dancers. Each dance consists of a number of individual figures or steps, and each part has a certain length and type of tune. The skibbereen, for example, consists of 136 bars of polkas, 80 bars of slides, another 208 bars of polkas, 120 bars of slides, and finally 120 bars of polkas. And God help you if you miss out a bar. I think you probably get the picture. Playing for sets is extremely specific and demanding, and you have to know exactly what you're doing. Among the best known dancers are St. Patrick's Day, The Blackbird, Job of Journey Work and The Garden of Daisies. 
These will be known to Irish dancers the world over. There are also local speciality dances, such as the Sleeve Lucre, the West Kerry, the Clare Lancers and the Connemara Reel. Now Cayley dancing. Cayley is an Irish Gaelic word for social gathering, for dance and music. The Scottish and usually English spelling is Cayley with a DH at the end. The idea first gained prominence in Ireland at the end of the 19th century, when the Gaelic League, an organisation formed to promote Gaelic culture, began to organise dances. Set dancing, although popular, was viewed as being an English import, and so new dances such as the Walls of Limerick, the Siege of Ennis, Sweets of May and the Bridge of Athlone and the Haymakers Jig were introduced. Like set dancing, these were social dances for groups of people in lines, squares, circles and four couple sets. Probably the first band formed to specialise in playing for these dancers was the Kilfenora Cayley Band in County Clare, still going strong today. Clare is a particular stronghold of Cayley playing, being home also to the Kilfenora's chief rival, the Tuller Cayley Band, and many others. One feature of the early Cayley Bands was their numbers. Whilst most dancing had been done previously to solo fiddle or pipes, the Cayley Bands often had accordion, piano, drums, along with several fiddles, flutes, piccolos or whistles. The notorious Public Dance Halls Act of 1935 put an end to informal dancing in Ireland and people were henceforth expected to dance in halls built specially by the parish church with profits shared by church and state. Though a disaster for traditional music in general, it was a boon for the Cayley bands. In an era before amplification, these larger halls required the volume that only a full-sized Cayley band could provide. Cayley bands of necessity were disciplined and organised. Strict tempo and tight unison playing was important, whilst ornamentation, variation and improvisation, regarded by many as the areas where most of the artistry of the music resided, were largely redundant. Cayley bands were very popular, though not with everyone. Sean O'Reader was a highly influential figure in the 1960s, striving for the first time to have traditional music treated as an art form. His group, Kjoltori Hulan, dressed in black tie and played arrangements of traditional music in concert halls. This was a direct forerunner of the Chieftains, arguably the most successful Irish folk group ever. To Oreda, Cayley music was an abomination, its sound akin to that of a blue bottle in a jam jar. Let's look at playing in a Cayley band today. Today Cayley bands are still popular. The old bands such as the Kilfenora still play in much the same style as ever, but Cayley playing in general is a little more relaxed and less formal. With the advent of amplification, large lineups are no longer a necessity, so size and instrumentation are much more variable. Cayleys are a good way for many traditional musicians to make some regular money, particularly at weddings. In Ireland, people will often know all the steps to the dancers, but elsewhere, in England for example, there is usually a caller with the band to explain the moves. The caller chooses the dancers. The band then has to select a suitable set of tunes, 32 bar jigs, 40 bar reels and so on. It's not just the length that's important, the feel and phrasing of the tune should also to some extent match the phrasing of the dance. If there's any debate about tempo for any of the tunes, always defer to the caller. He or she knows what works for the dancers, and it's not necessarily the same as you would play the tunes in a session. The dancing is far less complicated than for step or set dancing, and mixed or crooked tune sets are rarely called for. Nevertheless, it's important for the band leader to give a clear introduction, to call out when the tune changes and to give warning of the final time round. Talking while playing is an art in itself. He or she should also be aware of what is happening on the dance floor. Often the dancers will not keep in step with the music and there may be a sudden need for an extra eight bars in order to let them catch up. Some dancers have clapping sections. Ideally, you will have tunes where this rhythm falls naturally into the melody. Polkas often work well for this and it may well be appropriate to modify the tune on the spot to incorporate the clap-clap-clap rhythm. In playing for Cayley, a fiddler should aim for a clear melody, a strong bouncy rhythm and careful attention to tempo. The modern practice of constantly varying the bowing and moving the emphasis around on different phrases is not ideal for Cayley. A strong, even rhythm on the downbeat is what you should aim for. If you are the only melody player, some ornamentation and minor variation will be welcome. If there are several other melody players, best to keep it straight down the line. Full-on improvisation may be tempting to fiddlers who would rather be at a rock or jazz gig, and I'm looking at a younger Chris Haig here, but it's not to be recommended. Bands often use sheet music rather than playing by ear. Whilst being against the general ethos of traditional music, this helps to keep the music disciplined and avoids the need for the question, what's the next tune, and enables guest or depth musicians to fill in for any regular member of the band. A useful tip in this situation is to take along a portable light that will clip to your stand. 
The music is no use if the organisers decide that semi-darkness makes for the best ambiance. Whilst any decent musician can play in a Cayley band, having the pad, the book of music, knowing which tunes belong with which dancers, being able to lead confidently into a tune, and having some knowledge of the dancing, these are all valuable assets which can make you a potential band leader in your own right. Now let's look at Scottish dance. Scotland also has a well-established dance scene, dating back hundreds of years. Fiddlers such as Neil Gow in the 18th century were able to make a living playing at balls for aristocrats such as the Duke of Athol. Unlike in Ireland at the time, there would often be a three or four piece band with a second fiddle and cello in the lineup. Many of the tunes and dances were published at the time and remain part of the current repertoire. Scottish country dancing today has two branches. The more formal is the descendants of those 18th century balls. Dancers often attend classes, learning fancy footwork and complex dance sequences, and will appear correctly attired in kilts, gowns and so on. Such dancers follow rules set down by the RSCDS, the Royal Scottish Country Dance Society, and are still often associated with the upper classes and the military. There will be no caller at such events, since all are expected to know the steps in advance. Scottish Cayley is the more informal version, where a caller is more likely and there will be more modern dancers such as waltzers mixed in with the traditional ones. Playing for Scottish dancing is a little different from its Irish counterpart. There are a great number of reels plus a number of strass Some dancers require mixed sets of tunes. The Gay Gordons, for example, may use Scotland the Brave, a march, alternating with Cock of the North, a jig. Most dancers are in 32 bar sections, but the eights and reel requires 40 bars, followed by eight by 32 bars, followed by another 40 bars. Other standard dancers include the Reel of the 51st, Dashing White Sergeant, the Duke of Perth and the Strip the Willow. Tunes are often played only once at a time, so a set of four tunes may be needed for each dance, often played in the order 1, 2, 3, 4, 2, 3, 4, 1. An excellent reference point for style, tempo and repertoire is the recordings of band leader Jimmy Shand, though you will find the fiddle well down in the mix, kept well in place by drums, accordion and piano. Unlike in Irish music, a strong, almost classical tone with plenty of vibrato is appropriate for the fiddler. Country dancing in England has a very long tradition, dating back to Elizabethan times. The first published collection of dances and tunes was by John Playford in 1651, the English dancing master. Country dancing was immensely popular across the social spectrum, peaking in the late 18th century. Part of its success probably derived from the fact that it was a way for the high and mighty to play at being country folk, and vice versa. Jane Austen and Thomas Hardy both frequently mention country dancing in their writing. Hardy was himself a fiddler, and it's said that the 12-year-old Thomas, one night at a dance, played the new-rigged ship continuously for 45 minutes and had to be stopped by his hostess for fear that he would burst a blood vessel. By Hardy's time in the 19th century, country dancing was in decline, threatened by new dancers from the continent, such as the polka, quadrille and waltz. Rapid industrialisation was depopulating the countryside and rural traditions were declining. For the best part of a century, English country dancing virtually disappeared, and it was not till the turn of the 20th century that interest was revived, a product of the Romantic nationalism sweeping Europe. Cecil Sharp, a music teacher and composer, happened upon a performance by the Headington Quarry Morris Dancers in 1899. Morris dancing was a largely rural tradition, more ritual than social, which had made very little impact on urban or elite culture. By the time of Sharp's chance encounter, it was virtually extinct. With the help of Mary Neal of the Esperance Girls Club in London, he began a revival, both of Morris dance and eventually English country dance as a whole. Chris Leslie, as well as playing with the legendary folk group Fairport Convention, is a fiddler with Adderbury Morris. I asked him about the particular demands of playing for Morris dancing. He said, Playing for the Adderbury dancers has taught me a lot about keeping a steady pace and getting lift into a tune, a feeling of upward movement, if you like following the dancers in the air to reiterate the pulse of their feet as they land back on the ground. I watch the stepping of one of the front dancers, keeping locked into the rhythm, which I feel is more important than the melody. The dancers will respond to the fiddle's pulse as well, and it's an amazing feeling when the ideal happens and the two parts of the whole are completely in sync. It becomes an effortless flow in which both musician and dancer are responding to the other. Unlike in Ireland and Scotland, English country dancing is a reinvented tradition. As such, there's less formality than elsewhere in the British Isles. Country dancing exists within the folk scene, 
at annual folk festivals and dance clubs. Here you will expect a degree of finesse and technique, and also among the general public at weddings and parties, where being at the wrong place at the wrong time and frequently ending up in a heap on the floor is the order of the day. One word of warning if you're booked for this type of event in England. The person who books you, particularly if it's a general music agent, may well have no idea of the difference between Irish step dance, Scottish country dance, English folk dance, American hoedown or Serbian colo dance. It's always worth asking in advance, is there a theme for the dance? I'm sure my band is not the first one to have turned up to a dance in jeans and cowboy hats, only to find the audience in ball gowns and kilts. The American equivalent of English country dancing is contra dance. This became popular in America and particularly in New England in the 19th century and saw a revival in the 1950s and 60s. It's now popular throughout the US. Dancers form lines down the hall and mostly the steps are walked. There is always a caller and this is relaxed social dance, neither overtly energetic nor competitive. From a musical point of view, almost anything goes for contra dance, providing the tunes are square and 32 bars in length. The core of the repertoire is Anglo-Celtic, but old time, French Canadian and even Swedish and klezmer tunes are sometimes played. Jigs and reels can be played together in a set, providing the same tempo prevails. These tempos can be very fast, ranging from 108 to 130 BPM. One of the key sources for typical contradance tunes is the publication called the Portland Collection, with over 600 tunes in two volumes. Fiddle is usually the lead instrument, with accompaniment very often including piano. One of the leading fiddlers is Rodney Miller from New Hampshire. His clear, uncluttered style is, like his repertoire, a mixture of Scottish, Irish and American. Another popular form of dancing in America is square dancing. This is another descendant of English country dance and the quadrille. It is mostly danced by four couples in square formation. Since arriving in America, it has evolved independently and there are now two different strands. Modern Western square dancing is fairly technical and participants often attend classes to learn the steps. As with step dancing in Ireland, the music and dancers have become somewhat divorced. The callers prefer to use recorded music so that they have complete control of a tempo, key and length and they will often use country or even rock music rather than traditional tunes. Also like step dancing, the dancers are expected to dress traditional, i.e. cowboy shirts, boots, frilly skirts and so on. Despite the fact that this tradition only goes back a couple of decades, previously people would have simply worn their Sunday best. The other branch of square dancing is traditional square dance. It tends to be more relaxed and social, with no experience or skill required. This is what may be also referred to as a barn dance or hoedown, and there is more likely to be live music. In both types of square dance, the caller is likely to do singing calling or patter calling. The instructions will be at least in part melodic and rhythmic. This is an important consideration for the musicians, as the caller will need you to be playing in the right key and may require a specific tune. Many square dancers are songs in their own right, such as Marching Through Georgia, Little Brown Jug, The Girl I Left Behind Me, Red Wing and Golden Slippers. They also tend to be specifically American in origin, rather than Anglo-Celtic. Fiddle tunes such as Sally Goodin and Sugar in the Good are also favourites, as they are droney tunes, mostly holding on a single chord, easy for the caller to sing over. Callers may sometimes ask for phrased tunes. By this they mean tunes where each four-bar section is distinct and preferably not joined by some kind of linking phrase. This makes it easier for the dancers to associate their steps with the different sections of the tune. There are various habits among bluegrass players which need to be kept in check if playing for square dance or contra dance. Hell for leather tempos are definitely not a good idea nor are improvised fiddle breaks, or the extra beats or bars which are often slipped in at the end of sections in a bluegrass context. Now some conclusions. In this brief survey of dance traditions, we have seen that each one has its own distinctive history and social context. Whether it's the set dancing, step dancing or Cayley dancing of Ireland, the formal Scottish dance, the arcane world of Morris dance, or the western and contra dances of the USA. From the musician's point of view, each requires some understanding of the requirements of the dance floor, which are often very different from those of the session or the performance. The more you understand what's actually going on off the stage, the better you will play, and the more satisfying you will find the experience.